Hello, uh, everyone, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, World Water Day, which is uh, celebrated on the 22nd of March every year. And uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with you all. And uh, today I'm going to discuss something slightly differently in the sense that it's about a disease. Uh, it's about a, a disorder. It's about a neurodegenerative condition, uh, Alzheimer's disease specifically, and uh, which is one type of dementia. And you may ask, you know, what's the role of water in all this? And I will try and sort of make a presentation today to show the mindset that we have in the world today, which actually hinders progress in science and research. Mindset sometimes full of envy, jealousy, uh, you know, not being able to look at the picture in a bigger way, lack of collaboration, lack of cooperation, and so on. So today, what I'm trying to do is bring to uh, the surface and bring to, uh, you know, to the eyes of the world certain ideas I think that needs to be considered so that we can advance scientific research quickly. I am of the opinion that scientific research and data and information should be made publicly accessible, publicly available. We should not hold information. We should not keep things secret and, you know, hidden away and keep it, you know, sort of absent from the gaze of the world. Because when more information becomes available to the world, someone better than me may take this idea and build on it. And I prefer this than keeping on to things and keep being secretive. And so today, this presentation is actually something that I am very happy to do. And I'm lucky to be in a country where I have access to water. Today is the World Water Day. And I feel extremely sad that right now there are people in this world who are dying of thirst. There are people who are drinking water that is unsafe. There are elderly people who are in hospitals who are getting dehydrated. So there are so many things happening around us today, right now, that causes me grief. But at the same time, through these discussions and debates and awareness, I think we can improve the society around us locally and globally. So as I start, I drink some water, but at the same time, I remember all those people who have passed away because they did not have access to water, because they're denied access to water, or they are uh, not being cared for properly that led to their death. So to begin, I drink some water and I hope all of you out there also have access to water and can enjoy the water. So I'm someone who's always grateful. I'm grateful to those who help me. And I'm grateful that I'm living in a country where I have access to water. I can go to my kitchen and collect water and I drink. So gratefulness, I think, is a very important quality. Sometimes some people lack this tendency, and that is very sad. So to begin with, I drink some water. So the presentation is, what is the role of water in Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia? And as I said at the beginning, I like to devote and dedicate this lecture to the memory of all those who lost their lives due to thirst and dehydration as a consequence of being prevented from access to water. That has happened historically, that is happening even now, and it is happening uh, you know, all around the world, in all the different continents in a matter, as a matter of fact, sometimes through negligence, sometimes through deliberate uh, you know, acts and so on, because of inadequate care, because of inadequate love or compassion, especially with respect to our elders and the vulnerable who cannot call out for water, cannot go to the kitchen to get some water. Right now, in my home, I have my mother. She depends on me and my wife and my children for her water because she cannot go to the kitchen, because she cannot work. She is disabled because of a neurodegenerative condition she has. And this presentation I'm making is inspired by her, actually. The energy that I have is through this suffering that she has gone through and what I have seen. And therefore, it is this sort of feeling of passion that drives me to make this presentation in front of you, because I could easily just sit around and enjoy my time drinking some coffee or doing some other things, you know, that I need to do. Or, of course, you know, I could just, you know, busy myself with just my own selfish, uh, you know, goals and ambitions. Here, I'm trying to do something which I hope will help uh, in some way to create awareness and create research interest so that the world becomes a better place. So access to clean water is a major global health challenge. This is why the United Nations has, you know, sort of dedicated a day, 22nd of March, uh, every year to, the, uh, to be called the World Water Day. But to be honest, water day should be every day. In our mind, water should be there all the time. There should be some sort of campaigns and education given to our children and youngsters that water is an important part of our life. No amount of work or no matter how busy schedule you have, should not pre prevent us from getting access to water or should not prevent us from giving water to our elderly 
to our parents, to those who are vulnerable. So this is an important point we need to make uh, in this presentation, that what a day is not a day on the 22nd of March only, but should be every day. And you know, the third thing is, of course, you know, we are not short of money. We have money to do lots of research. We send satellites, we send, you know, sort of like uh, lots of different rockets and other uh, space technology are being used to look for water in other planets, in planet Mars and so on. And yet we have in this world, in this planet, shortage of water and lack of water, lack of clean water. And so I think sometimes I feel that we need to sort of like think about our uh, priorities in different ways. Even now today, as I'm talking, there is a war going on in Ukraine uh, with the invasion uh, that has taken place uh, recently. And there is political, you know, uh, uh, you know, upheaval going on. But at the end, there are people whose lives are being affected. It doesn't matter if you're a Russian or whether you're Ukrainian or whether you are somebody else. It's a human life we're talking about. And therefore, any life lost is a tragedy, whether it is the loss of a Russian soldier or whether it is a loss of a Ukrainian soldier or a civilian. All human lives are precious and sacred. And we must remember that even at this war, there are people who are having uh, difficulties getting access to water and even dying from thirst. So we should not forget at this time on the World Water Day what is happening in Ukraine. And we share, I, I share my feelings for all those people who are affected there, irrespective of whether they're Russians or whether they're Ukrainians, because they're all human beings. And that is the important thing. And we should do everything to bring the war to an end so that every human being can live in peace and tranquility and have access to water and so on. One of the points that I try to make all the time in my presentations, and I try to tell my students and so on, is that water seems to be something in the background. Water is something that is, you know, something like when you're playing football on a football pitch, you know, the players are the ones you look at. You forget the grass, you forget the ground. It's just something in the background. Or in a house, it is the, you know, sort of the, the wall behind you or something like that. It's just there. It's not important. And yet, water is the most fundamental molecule uh, that without which we cannot exist. All the chemical reactions in our body takes place in water or a water environment. Water is pivotal in the formation of proteins. And yet, there are so many publications on proteins. There are over 4 million publications on proteins. And the number of publications on water, what the word water is mentioned in scientific literature, is much fewer. You know, it's around three and a half million. But I would have expected that the number of mention to water would exceed mentioning of any other molecule that we have in this planet, because water is the most important and fundamental molecule for all aspects of life, whether it actually means surviving. Water is, you know, in many cultures, the name for water is life. And I really, truly believe in that. And yet, Today, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that many people around the world did not have access to water for washing their hands. Even washing their hands, they had difficulty, which here in the UK, we have plenty of access to. So there is an issue of water accessibility that is uh, around the world, and it's an accessibility issue. But also, sometimes we have water accessible in the UK. We have plenty of water in the UK. So how come we have problems with dehydration, where many of our elders and many other people who are in the hospital died? and people in the care homes die. So it's not always about accessibility to water. Water could be accessible, but someone may not be able to reach it. Someone may be prevented from reaching it. So there are many issues that prevent people from accessing water, and we need to understand what these are. I'm not just about providing clean water, making sure that those who need water get the water at the right time. And I'll tell a story of my own during this presentation, which will give an indication of how important access to water is. So the next slide that I'm going to go to is about, you know, I have got here three different images taken from the media. On the left-hand side, you can see, uh, you know, the, uh, the liquid water has been discovered on planet Mars. So buried lakes uh, of liquid water has been discovered on planet Mars. And this is exciting scientific research. As I'm all for scientific research in all forms because science leads to finding the truth. The more scientific research that gets done, the more truth will appear. And therefore, it, well, I'm always in favor of research. We may go through a lot of different iteration processes, lots of different modifications and refinements before we reach the truth. But this is a journey. Scientific research is a journey. If good research is done, it will lead to the truth. And here, people have gone to planet Mars to look for water. But on the right-hand side, you can see a child in Africa who is in a very desperate situation trying to find some clean water to drink. Can you see how, you know, in a planet where we have, you know, millions of people living, billions of people living, and yet we do not have any, enough water, and yet we do not do enough, I think, in my point of view, to provide, uh, you know, access to water for all human beings, wherever they may be. And people die all the time due to 
dehydration. There are people who are trying to come to Europe from Africa. Some of them died through excess exposure to water by drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. And there are others who die in the dry lands, in the deserts. So here, for example, I have is a picture on the right hand side. There is a situation where people have died. There are 40 people have died of thirst in the Sahara Desert on their way to come to Europe. So you can see how water is having an impact of life on human life. Sometimes you have plenty of water and that kills you. And sometimes you have very little water and that also kills you. And these migrants, some of them died due to, uh, you know, being in the seawater and drowning in the seawater. So there are 2 billion people on this planet Earth without access to cleaning water. And yet we don't really, uh, uh, you know, have enough knowledge about water and uh, have not done enough to provide water. You know, for example, take this example. This is the World Water Day. You know, scientists cannot tell the public how many glasses of water they should drink. You know, there is this old saying that has been based on unproven scientific, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, background, which is that eight glasses of water is what you need daily. And this, this, you know, myth in a way has been perpetuated. And everyone talks about you must have eight glasses of water a day. But there is no scientific proof for this. But the question is, what are the scientists? Why haven't we done enough? to identify what is the amount of water required for a human being of different age, different gender, different ethnicity, different occupation, different levels of physical activity and so on. Why cannot we design an app or some technology which will enable people to use their data, their, all the data that's available in the GP and so on, to give them an idea of how much water they need and how often they need to drink it. Why can't we do that? This can be done. Why isn't that being done? Is it because there is not much money to be made? So these are issues that we need to think about and really do things uh, so that human beings, uh, the maximum number of human beings can benefit, not just the few, but the maximum, to make it accessible and cheap so that the maximum benefit is gained rather than the benefit of a few. Uh, uh, and this is my uh, belief that I want to do things which benefits everything, if everyone, and not to keep things hidden and shielded and covered up so that others do not benefit. This, I think, is uh, mean. Uh, hoarding is not a good thing, whether hoarding of, uh, you know, goods, whether it is rice or, you know, sugar is not good. Neither is the hoarding of knowledge good. So knowledge should be shared and transmitted. And don't fear about someone taking your knowledge. If they do, it doesn't matter. At least you can feel good that your idea was used by someone to benefit others. So don't feel sort of like so cagey about being secretive about things and keeping things away and not sharing ideas. So this is, this is a message I like to give to all researchers and especially the young who are now on their journey to become scientists and so on. And many of my students are actually uh, listening to this lecture, I know. Many of them are attending, PhD students, master's students, and undergraduate students. So I hope they will, uh, you know, sort of listen to what I have to say in respect to sharing knowledge and not being, you know, sort of miserly with knowledge. So what makes uh, the difference between life? What makes the difference between life and death? And this is a personal story here, I want to say, because this has been one of the main things that has triggered me to actually come out with this new hypothesis. I saw what was happening to my mother. This was having an impact on me. I was feeling sad, I was feeling unwell. All of these things actually triggered me to bring forward an idea that I had thought about for some time, but I was never sort of like coming forward about with it because I wanted to do more and more and more before I exposed it to the world. But one thing that happened is that my mother's illness and my own feeling of sadness and almost feeling of illness as a consequence of what I was seeing with her actually triggered me to do something about this. Here you can see on the left hand side, my parents, my father who passed away in 2019, October 2019, and then, and then my mother. And as you can see, they always respect education. I'm sitting down and they're standing. And the reason for that is they respect education. I became a graduate and they were not graduates. Okay, they were all educated, but they were not graduates. They did not have university degree. They went to college and so on, but they did not get university degree. So they are very proud of me. And you can see they allowed me to sit down on the, uh, on the chair and they stood up to take this picture. So this was in 1985. And then I like you to see the picture of 2020. What happened in 2020, we know, is the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. My mother was in Wales and it was in my brother's house. She fell because she was always falling over and she never knew why she was falling over. And she was always asking, why am I falling over? Why am I falling over? So she fell, she broke her arm, she went to the hospital. And there, you know, I was here in, uh, in uh, Leicester uh, and she was in uh, Wales and she was in a very bad way, in very bad condition and so on. 
and she, uh, she, uh, she had delirium. And uh, of course, at that time in 2020, no one was allowed to go into the hospitals because of the COVID-19 uh, security, protecting the public and protecting the spreading of the disease to the workers, the uh, healthcare workers, and also the health workers transmitting the disease to the public. So this was a tragic time. I think these were the darkest days in my living memory of living in the UK, without doubt. The COVID-19 pandemic was the most darkest days for me for my family and for many people. And I feel so sad about it. I feel really, really sad about it. The reason for that is because people were separated from one another. My mother was in hospital. I could not go and see her. You know, she was weak, she was tired. And this is the person who bought me, you know? And I'm the oldest of her sons. She had eight pregnancies and three children died. And I'm the oldest and we are five brothers. And she spent all her life taking care of her, us. She never managed to sleep properly because she was always wanting to take care of us. She would not eat properly because she wanted to, you know, take care of others first. So she was a very self-sacrificing person, you know, for everybody, not just for, uh, for me and my brothers and my father, but for everybody. She was a generous person. Everyone who came to our house was always well fed. She would cook a lot of food and things like that. She's well known, well loved in our community. And she fell ill and she was in the hospital and I could not go. Ultimately, because she was delirium and she just started shouting and talking and because she completely lost her mind. And as a consequence of that, they allowed us to enter the hospital. And you can see here my brother, uh, he is my uh, third uh, brother. He, you can see him, he's feeding my mother water. You can see on this picture here. This is in a hospital in Newport in 2020. He is feeding her water. And do you know what happened? After they allowed us to, because they had no choice, because they could not really manage her. And so they allowed us to enter the hospital. And do you know what happened? As a consequence of us entering, she managed to express and communicate. Do you remember, we live in a world sometimes where it is the survival of the fittest. If you have muscle power, if you can speak loudly, you know, you have contacts in high places, then things happen for you. But if you don't have any of these things, you're weak, you are oppressed, you know, you don't have big muscle, big power, then, no one cares for you. You do not. You cannot shout out, and you cannot ask for help. So what happened with my mother was, of course, she's an elderly person. Elderly person cannot speak out and say, "Give me water," or "Give me food," or even if the water is left nearby, they cannot sometimes reach out. I saw this myself with my mother. She said, "Oh, I did not get the food. I did not get the water." Another reason for all of these things is because elderly patients, when the uh, healthcare workers are so busy, the nurses are busy. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I don't blame the nurses. I don't blame the doctors. Every Thursday night, I went out of my home and clapped. But I thought clapping was not as good as giving them extra money, actually. They deserve more money than claps. But in any case, I clapped for them. Why? Because they sacrificed and they went and took care of the patients, risking their own lives. In some countries, in some countries, I can tell you, when they saw COVID-19 patients coming in, they ran away. The doctors ran away. They forgot about the Hippocratic oath that you should look after the patients. So. We are, I am proud of our NHS, but the NHS could not cope, it could not manage. And I saw with my own eyes, if we are not allowed to go and give my uh, mother water and food, she would have died without doubt. I'm quite confident and quite sure she would have died. There is a student from this university who talked with me, you know, her grandmother, actually, I don't know if she's listening to the talk, actually. Uh, she's a journalism student and she was telling me, that her grandmother was also nearly dying in the hospital. But once she was allowed to get in and give her food and nutrition and water, she recovered very quickly and she returned home. So this is the same story with the case of my mother during this COVID-19 pandemic. She was probably going to die. So when we went in, you can see on that picture, lots of fluid that we've taken. You know, in the hospital, they would do their best. They would give some water and they'll give some food. And if my mother is not going to take it, they don't have the time to hang around and say, oh, come on, take more, you have to drink. If you don't drink, you're going to get dehydrated. If you don't drink, then you're going to die. Oh, you know, so you're going to fall ill. They're not going to say all of these things. But the family is going to do those things. And because the families are not allowed to enter, I believe many patients, many elderly people died because of dehydration. And there are people I know who have told me that their parents also nearly died, or father or mother nearly died because of dehydration. So dehydration was a huge issue. So this World Water Day, I devote and I dedicate this presentation in memory of all those people who have died because of dehydration in hospitals. And this presentation, I like the public health authorities to see this. 
the you know the important uh, you know decision makers to see this so that changes can be made to ensure that you know people are supported and given water so that they do not dehydrate and die it's not enough just putting some water on the table or some food on a table and expecting an elderly person to help themselves to the water no it's not going to happen that is why our participation my brother myself we helped and my mother recovered she came back uh, home from the hospital so this is the point I, I really wanted to spend a bit of time on this because my development and my growing up as a human being has been due to these two people you can see behind me there my mother and father they taught me to respect others not to harm others but to help others wherever possible to help others anyone knocking on my door i got to help them anyone asking to seek help from me i must help them because this is the teaching that i have received and this i try my best within my capacity wherever i am to be able to do as much as i can on this front and i hope i can continue in this area so so this is what the motivation of today's presentation is two things i have done here is that i've shown the fact that dehydration kills people around the world dehydration kills people locally dehydration um, uh, you know uh, nearly kills people like in the case of my mother that i'm talking about and so on so on this world water day i think this is an important point i think there is no other important point i can make than this that there has been so many tragic loss of lives due to dehydration no doubt and dehydration led to deaths before pre pandemic times lots of death i'll give you examples but during the pandemic lot of the deaths happened immediately because of dehydration and that i think is something that the uh, you know there is an inquiry about covid-19 that is happening and and this is covid-19 pandemic and this inquiry should look into the dehydration issue and how in the future how in the future dehydration in hospitals care homes and wherever it is is prevented i think this is one of the things that the uh, the covid-19 uh, you know inquiry that is being you know set up uh, going should look into in my opinion i hope they will do that okay acknowledgement as i said i'm always a great uh, a grateful person i think this is an important characteristic that a human being should have in my opinion you should be grateful to those who has who have helped you and and the, one of the most important person who who developed me as a scientist and because of his uh, you know training that he trained me and this is professor dennis chapman a fellow of the royal society he was my mentor he was my phd supervisor uh, he was a great man he was a great friend and uh, i cannot you know make a presentation without remembering him because he taught me and he supported me and he guided me and it led me to become a scientist in due course and he is a uh, person who actually made a pivotal role in all of these things so how can i not forget him and the reason i'm bring that is also to encourage all the youngsters all the young people to always be grateful and to show gratitude gratitude to those who have helped you in a small way even and i think that is an important characteristic that we should all have and here i'm thinking professor denny chapman here he is showing uh, you know very young looking prince charles the structure of phospholipid molecules because he used to work on liposomes i used to work on liposomes which are phospholipid vesicles cell membrane structure we used to work on these things and looking at the uh, fluidity effect of cholesterol on uh, cholesterol on membrane uh, fluidity and so on interactions of proteins with membranes and so on so he's showing here he found a company called uh, biocompatibles international plc which is one of the first scientists in the uk who took basic science and uh, worked with basic science but went into applied science and developed a company called biocompatibles plc unfortunately died of alzheimer's disease sadly so this is another connection for my presentation and this is also dedicated to his memory because he was my mentor he was my teacher he was my phd supervisor and i wrote his obituary in a journal called trends in biochemical sciences which you can find in the literature if you are interested to know more about him so this is something that i need to say because it's important and here it was a very uh, multicultural group of scientists at the royal free uh, ucl uh, university college london now royal free hospital school of medicine you can see it's very multicultural we have visitors from china many of these people i'm in contact with and um, you know uh, michael jackson here yeah, um, did his degree at manchester university and then did his phd published papers with him he's now in, in canada and so we have lots of different people here lots of people uh, uh, christine hall uh, here so there is uh, you know sort of like a very multicultural group we used to have great time together and so i have great memories of that and uh, that formed me and that led to whatever i'm going to be present today is a consequence of the interdisciplinary uh, nature of science that Dennis Chapman taught me and i have to uh, thank him 
There are other people I have to thank, and this is this is someone uh, who I'm working with now for some years, and this is um, Paul Ellingworth. Paul Ellingworth is here, and I also, of course, have to thank um, Simon Aldroyd, because I also worked with him for many, many years. And we are here all together in the opening of the lab called the Biomedical and Environmental Health Lab, opened by Sir Paul Nars here, a Nobel Prize winner. He came and uh, opened the lab and also made a presentation. And here is Paul. That's in 2017. But you know, Paul is such a resilient guy. I mean, you know, he had a, uh, you know, he told me about his history, about his life, how he grew up. And, uh, you know, he told me about various experiences he had. And he had bowel cancer, you know, some years back before I actually came to know him. And he overcame bowel cancer. And then, more recently, he had oral cancer, mouth cancer. And here he is, there is a picture of him in the hospital. And here he is again, uh, you know, another picture of him. Here you can see that he, this was during the time when he was receiving treatment in the hospital. And despite all the difficulties he was going through, he was a man who did not give up. He was working with me. He was publishing with me actually. You know, we worked together on a paper during the pandemic time, paper that has been published in Perspectives in Public Health, as you can see on the right hand side, installing public hand washing facilities and integrating them with water fountains to reduce plastic pollution and prevent spread of infections. The idea was that, you know, we have water fountains now springing up all around the country, especially in London. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, I think has done a great job in introducing these fountains, water fountains, so that people can just get the water from the fountains instead of having to sort of carry bottles with them or buy bottled water and so on, which is costly. This is a good idea. So one of the things we suggested in this article was that why not have also at the same time a facility for washing hands so that you know the two things can be nearby with each other part of the same plumbing and so on if at all possible so we wrote an article about this and uh, so he's an active guy and he's an inspiration to me and that is why you know this gives me the energy to do things and write things and so on because i do have a very uh, tough life uh, in many respects but uh, uh, i feel that i need to do something to help others and people like paul who despite all his difficulties continues to work hard and lead a very big department, the uh, School of Allied Health Sciences, is an inspiration, actually. And he's doing, he did, done a 5K, uh, you know, sort of running for raising money for mouth cancer. And now he's doing, again, 10K this time to raise money for mouth cancer. There's a link here. I do not know if you can see, but Paul, uh, he's, uh, you know, raising money for cancer research. If you want to support him, go to the link, just giving and give him uh, money that will go to research, which is always important to make progress. So this is another person I have to thank because, and he, and with respect to water theory, in a way I have discussed with him some aspects, and uh, you know, like for example the hand washing and so on. We published an article on that. So now I'd like to come to the uh, origin of this hypothesis and the link between water and Alzheimer's. Where did it start? Where did it all start? Well, it actually started long ago, long ago. You know, one of the things that actually fascinated me was that how come, you know, trees take up water, you know, hundreds, over 100 meters in height from the ground up to 100 meters in height? How does it happen? What actually, you know, you know, enables these trees to draw water from the ground to such higher places? So obviously, you know, whoever has done biology, uh, you know, studies uh, at the fundamental level, uh, school level and so on, will know that the leaves are the main source for uh, the main driver for the movement of water from the ground to the top of the tree because you have transpiration occurring the evaporation of water from the leaves and this leads to a suction hydraulic uh, you know pressure negative pressure that draws the water up the tree to the top of the tree 100 meter high the power of water evaporation is amazing absolutely amazing and that is the thing that actually made me fascinated about thinking about the wider dimension about water evaporation in human beings. Because water evaporation in human beings on the whole is looked at in a very negative way. And I found that somewhat, you know, sort of, um, you know, astonishing. I found that completely sort of, you know, that hyperhidrosis and everything is obviously a health issue and that is a cause for concern. But normal perspiration, you know, when you are just normally, you know, perspiring and so on, even that has been, looked at in a very negative way, as if that was something bad. And if that was prevented, then all problems will be uh, solved. So, you know, preventing uh, water loss from the skin 
seem to be a habit that human beings have developed over recent times. And I just wonder why. And when I look at the tree and I see it's out there and its leaves are losing water, evaporating water, and that allows the tree to survive. That allows the tree to survive. And I was thinking to myself, if the leaves are the fundamental source of water for the plants, because this is what drives the uh, drawing of the water from the soil, from the ground, then why not the skin in human beings play an important role in the health of human beings? If plant health depends on the leaves, the skin health can also have an impact on the health of health of human beings. And this is what actually drew my thinking into this area. And I've been thinking about it for a long, long time. And uh, everything, you know, post-pandemic and my, my mother's situation, everything led me to sort of coming forward and opening up a discussion on this with others. But the thought has been there for a long time. The plants were the main things that made me think about the whole issue. You can see the tree here. This is the one of the uh, tallest trees you can see. And you can see the leaves here. You, you know, I don't need to tell you about trees. You all know about these things. But you can see on the right-hand side, one of my heroes, childhood heroes, Muhammad Ali, a great man uh, who unfortunately had uh, Parkinson's disease, a neurodegenerative dis uh, disorder. But you can see, you can see his body. You can see most of his pictures is sweating. He's sweating. He was a fit man. He was a strong man. So sweating was there all the time. And you can see his picture here. And you can see the human skin. Human skin is the largest organ in the human body. It cannot be there for just for cosmetic reasons. It has to be there for a more fundamental reason. And there, I think, is a uh, is is the one of my. I would say if there was a thinking that I have sort of come to, which I believe is fundamental and very important for others to know and others to work on, is working on the skin and understanding the skin better, the skin microbiome better, understanding the relationship between skin and water status in the human body, hydration in the human body, water balance in the human body. I think it's such an important issue that I think needs to be addressed and more work needs to be done on this area. And today's presentation will highlight how little we are doing in this area, including some of the most famous scientists you can think of, famous living scientists you can think of, that are today working in Alzheimer's disease. I'm, I'm sorry, but these people are often forgetting about the role of water. For them, water is just in the background. Nothing to be talked about, nothing to be mentioned about. I will show you some work published in the most, one of the most highest ranking scientific journals that anyone can publish in, Science, which is one of the journals from the USA, that one of the top ranking journals. That was the paper that actually triggered me to develop this hypothesis. And I will talk about this with you all, just to show you uh, the extent of uh, ignorance, not ignorance, I would say, you know, carelessness about the role of water uh, in, in biology and in, uh, and in science. So uh, one of the important key points, messages I want to convey through this presentation is that the traditional views about the function of the skin as well as sweating needs to change. Sweating is thought to be something just for thermoregulation. I believe sweating is not just for that. I believe sweating from the skin or loss of water through breathing, through the nose, through the mouth, through the ears and so on. And of course, you know, through the feces or through urine, urine, you know, uh, urinating and everything. All of these things are actually playing a fundamental role within our body in terms of uh, electrolyte balance in terms of circulation, in terms of waste move, removal, and even for the brain, for Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, the removal of the waste from the brain is driven by all of this water loss that is taking place, not just the pulsation of the heartbeat. They work together. I don't think we should look at things in a such sort of like different boxes. The heart is also connected with the screen. The brain is also connected with the skin. We are all connected. We are all integrated body, and we should look at it as a whole and not in part and part and part. And this sort of reductionist approach to scientific research has hindered progress. Our progress in scientific research has been hindered. And I'll give you an example of today, this leading research with work that has been cited nearly 4,000 times, where the important issue of water was completely left out. So this is an important point of my presentation, which I hope uh, the listeners will uh, take home and do research in their labs and do much more than I can ever do. That is why information has to be spread so that others more capable than me, others more resourceful than me, others in a better uh, equipped lab than me can do the work, even if I cannot do. Because my objectives are not that I have to do everything. 
My objectives are that human beings benefit from any little bit of idea that I have. And I like to devote all of anything that I have for the benefit of my parents because they were the ones who sacrificed their lives for my development. So this is, this is the thing which motivates me. So moving on, uh, Alzheimer's disease and all of these things. You know, why am I talking about this? Have I had any background in Alzheimer's disease research? Have I had any uh, background in water research? Thankfully, I'm, I do. So I'm not an imposter here. One of my good friends and uh, you know, uh, uh, colleague, Professor Brian Austin from St. George's Hospital actually is listening to this presentation, he's here. I understand he is here and he will be uh, listening in. Maybe he will make some comments. I worked with him on Alzheimer's disease, dementia related peptides, looking at their aggregation. So this paper is you know, about two decades. Two decades ago, we've been working on Alzheimer's, looking at peptides and aggregation and water and so on. So I'm, I'm not new to uh, dementia research and uh, aggregation and so on. Uh, this has been something that has been in my mind for many years, uh, as a matter of decades. Protein aggregation is an interesting area that I'm interested in. Now and then I try to do as much research as I can on this. My research is diversified into many areas, but water is the element, water is the compound, the substance that is always present in any research that I do. I always try to bring water into play in anything I'm trying to do. So this is this is an important point I like to say. Here I am back in 19, so I'm 86, working at the Royal Free, which is uh, UCL uh, University College London, uh, part of the medical school. And here I am actually, if anyone can see in detail, I'm, I'm recording the spectrum of water. So this is water analysis because I did analysis of peptides, including these uh, amyloids in aqueous environment. Amyloids are those uh, peptides that are found in the brain of people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. These are plaques that get deposited in the brain that kills the neurons. So I have been working on these things many years ago. So this interest in Alzheimer's disease and water is not something that is uh, uh, came to uh, the front yesterday. So this is a fundamental uh, diagram of my thinking and my research that I have produced for all of you to see and to get an idea of what it means. Uh, you see, the body goes through this cycle of water gain and water loss. Please focus on this diagram and that will give you the main thing that I'm trying to say here. The body goes through the water gain process and water loss process. So what happens when we lose water? We lose water when we are, for example, um, exercising. This is the best example I can give. Exercise, you lose a lot of water. You dehydrate, you sweat. There you have the example of why sweating is good for you. Because when, the, when you break a sweat, then you've actually exercised. That's what they say. Breaking a sweat is good. But if you put a lot of antiperspirant in all over the body, then the sweat won't come out. And you know the water balance will not be, and the water mobility and the water dynamics within the body will not be as uh, fluid, as, as and mobile as if you had the water flowing out. It's like a river. If you think of a river and you build a dam or you stagnate the river by putting lots of rocks and other garbage in there and you destroy the flow of the water, then in one section of the river, you will have, you know, sort of a, a foul smell appearing slowly. There will be stagnation. There will be bacteria, viruses, disease, and the whole place will stink and you'll run away from that place because it's become blocked. Same with a sink in your house. If your sink is blocked and there is water stuck there and it does not, there is no good flow of water, then you will have, you know, sort of, it will start smelling because of the rotting food and everything and so on. I see the same thing happening in the human body. If the human body, the water is stagnated, the water remains in the body, the water is retained in the body because it's not allowed to go out because people don't do any physical activity. They don't have the right foods, which enables the water to flow out of the body, diuretic foods, for example, parsley, for example, celery, even drinking tea and coffee. These things are compounds in them which enhance water removal. But of course, you got to re replenish the water that you lose. Otherwise, you'll be dehydrated. So when you do exercise, when you do running around, when you are, uh, you know, all of this physical activity, which is known to be the most important medicine, nature's best medicine is physical exercise. And past, in the past, our ancestors always used to be physically active. I look through the garden in my house, I look through the garden, I always see the birds and the other animals always moving, always moving. They're always on the move. They don't have big hospitals. They don't have doctors but they remain healthy for a long time. And the reason is they're always active. It's a human being who just loves to sit down on a chair and enjoy a lot of food and do nothing. And as a consequence, we bring in obesity, we bring in 
uh, you know, all of these other diseases that are associated with sedentary life. So this is the key point. Water is lost from our body through urine, from feces, sweat, from physical activity, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, insensible water loss. Insensible water loss is the water loss that you cannot measure that is lost through, for example, breathing through the nose and through sort of evaporation from the skin, not sweating, but just simple evaporation from the skin. So this is what is happening. You're losing water daily. We are losing water daily. And you know what? The interesting thing is the water loss during the nighttime is greatest. That is the reason why I think, and this is an important point, why sleeping is important. Because sleeping allows you to rest, gives the whole uh, body to relax. But not only that, it enables the body to now lose water through sleeping, through the breathing we do. And some people breathe more, some people breathe less. But we lose a lot of water. We do a bit of sweating. With the, there is a transepidermal evaporation going on. So the water is lost. Of course, we have uh, uh, hormones in our body which will retain sufficient amount of water so that our body does not become completely dehydrated. So, so there is a, you know, the mechanisms to ensure that uh, there is uh, some water left and some water is retained. So vasopressin uh, hormone, for example, will work on the kidneys to ensure that the water, not all the water is, uh, you know, um, uh, eliminated. So there is a, there is the sleeping actually is a opportunity for water uh, stress environment to be created in the body. This is some form of hormosis effect, which is a mild stress in the body, which actually has a positive effect in revitalizing the body, in enhancing the immune system. And importantly, in my opinion, what I believe that is happening is that the, sh the cells shrink. And this enables the wastes and other chemicals to be expelled into the interstitial space between the cells. And then can, this can then be eliminated from the body. So there is this process of shrinking and swelling. So if I could explain to you what I mean by shrinking and swelling. So when there is a plenty of water in the body, as you can see on the left-hand side, the cells are swollen, okay? They are quite big, they are swollen. So there is not much space between the cells. All the interstitial space is reduced, very little space. But when we have less water in the body because of water loss through exercise and so on, then the cells shrink because they lose water due to osmosis. And therefore, the water from the cells enter into the interstitial space. Cells shrink and the interstitial space increases. So this then clears the waste from the cells, and then this can then be removed by, for example, certain convective fluxes, such as the cere cerebral spinal fluid flux that removes it through the lymphatic system, which I'll come to later on. And so there is this cleansing effect of removing the waste that this um, water, uh, water plenty and water poor circumstance creates. So we are having a swelling and shrinking, swelling and shrinking, phenomena going around the body and it is a circadian rhythm too because in the night time when you are sleeping we are more dehydrated so the cells are more strong and during the daytime when you are awake we are drinking tea we are drinking coffee we are having food water is coming from all sorts all around and therefore our body is more hydrated so you can, you can see here so this is the situation water loss leads to cells being more separated from the uh, one another this is just a schematic diagram just to illustrate the point it is not perfect in terms of its details or anything like that just to show in a schematic way that when the water is lost we have the cells you know far from one another and therefore there is more space between them and then when you gain water once again we come back so there is a shrink shrinking and swelling dynamics going on and my theory related to this aspect is the shrinking and swelling of the cells is what drives waste removal from the body and this links with water. Water is the key player. And so we need to have this process of being somewhat dehydrated, as happens when you're fasting. You know, this is, intermittent fasting is going to be highly beneficial for health. This has now been shown. So you refrain from food, water from food, so water by drinking fluids for a short while. So there is this shrinking of cells going on. And then that allows the waste to be expelled from the cells. And then you make up for water later on. So this cycle of shrinking and swelling of cells driven by water loss and water gain in the body plays a fundamental role in the circulation of nutrients around the body as well as removal of waste from the body. This aspect has been ignored for far too long. It's all been given to the heart for pumping the blood around the body and water is just in the background. Water is just there. 
is not important. Sweating is not important. Insensible water loss through sleep is not important. The fact that workers have shown already that the body weight is reduced during sleep. Why is the body water body weight uh, you know lower during sleep, nighttime sleep? Why? Because lot more water has been lost. Why is the brain volume reduced during sleep? MRI, magnetic resonance imaging studies have shown that the brain volume reduces uh, under the sleeping condition because of dehydration, less water. Simple. There is no rocket science in all of these things. What I'm saying here is obvious. It's just that no one has articulated the case and put forward this hypothesis to the world. Here I'm trying my best to pro propose the idea that it is this water loss, water gain phenomena that plays a fundamental role in the body that has been ignored for far too long. And this has cost human lives. This has delayed the discovery of new drugs. Alzheimer's disease, we don't have a drug for it. The latest drug that was approved by the FDI, FDI uh, the, the Food and Drug, uh, FDA, Food, Food and Drug Administration in the USA, has been criticized by a lot of countries. Europeans are not accepting it. Uh, the, in the UK, uh, it is not being accepted either because its efficacy is not proven. People are questioning the hypothesis, which is called the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is that amyloids that are found in the brain are the cause for Alzheimer's disease. And therefore, removing them is the main way of uh, improving uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease or finding a treatment, finding a cure. This is now being questioned. People are thinking there might be other factors involved and so on. My presentation here is not uh, against the amyloid cascade hypothesis. Uh, it could be that the amyloid cascade hypothesis is true. Amyloids are produced and they're neurotoxic and there needs to be more. But maybe an easier way of removing them is through a cycle of activity that involves uh, water uh, gain, water loss. For example, in the UK, we have now Professor Roy Taylor uh, in the University of Newcastle. What he has done, and this is a fascinating work, I'm really impressed by his work. Because people used to think type 2 diabetes is irreversible. If you get diabetes, you cannot uh, go back to a situation where you are once again healthy. It was considered irreversible. Professor Roy Taylor, thankfully, he has managed to get the NHS on his side. And he has got big funding. And through this funding, what he did was able to actually uh, show that through an uh, in organized activity of physical activity, exercise, diet, and nutrition, you can actually uh, reverse type 2 diabetes. That is fascinating work. And here today, what I'm going to suggest, and I hope those people with the money, the funding, the resources, and the intellect, if these people come together to do a project where those people are different stages of the, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, some who have already uh, got the disease, some of them who may develop this disease because they have the genes or they may have the, you know, the, you know, the, um, all the different risk factors that you can see that may lead them to develop Alzheimer's disease to do a clinical trial study to see if exercise and the water uh, loss, water gain approach of ensuring that you have a good diet. For example, the Mediterranean diet is considered the number one diet in terms of protection against Alzheimer's disease. I looked at the uh, uh, Mediterranean diet. What, what is in there that is uh, good in terms of water uh, hypothesis that I'm suggesting here? And the most important thing that I found is that their diet is rich in water-rich foods. Plenty of water-rich foods. If you look at the foods that they eat, it's rich in water. Furthermore, it contains a lot of diuretic foods as well, celery and parsley. So this allows this movement of water in the body, water being lost and gained. They drink a lot of coffee. Coffee contains caffeine. It has diuretic effects. It removes the water from the body. So therefore, water retention issue, hypertension is a big problem. Hypertension is one of the factors for Alzheimer's disease. So you can see here, this diagram encapsulates the key hypothesis. And I hope someone will do a clinical trial to either prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease or if those people who have Alzheimer's disease to actually reverse it to uh, um, activity that is centered around water. So now I'm come to a, a person that I admire, and it is her ideas and research actually that led to this hypothesis that I have suggested here, and I hope she will win a Nobel Prize. She's, uh, her name is Bacon uh, Nedergaard, and she's from uh, as a position in the USA, Rochester University, and at the same time, she's also working in another university in Denmark. She was the first person to show that there is a system called the lymphatic system, which is a network of channels in the brain, and which uses the cerebral spinal fluid CSF to eliminate toxic waste, including the amyloid peptide, which is linked to Alzheimer's disease. You know what? I really think her discovery will lead her to getting a Nobel Prize, perhaps in the next two years. 
and I hope the Nobel Committee is listening to this presentation. She deserves it, and we need more women Nobel Prize winners. There are too few women winners, and I think she's one of them who's going to get it. Just, you know, you see, I do not bet, but I think she's got a great chance of getting the Nobel Prize, and I hope she does. And her work actually is the work that actually inspired me to develop this hypothesis, and that is why I'm here to actually uh, you know, explain what went wrong. So they worked on animals. So this glymphatic system is actually based around observations in animals. It has not been properly demonstrated in human beings, so there is still research that needs to be done to prove its existence and so on. So what they did was they looked at mice, and they looked at the appearance of amyloid in mice under three different conditions. One condition was the sleeping mice, another condition was anesthetized mice, and the third one was awake mice, to see if the clearance of the amyloids will depart depending on the uh, in the state of the consciousness and awake state. And they found that in the sleep condition, the removal of the amyloid was the greatest. So sleep enhances amyloid clearance. It's greater during sleep and also in anesthetized mice as well. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and this is although I admire her so much, and it is her who actually contributed to me suggesting this hypothesis and working on it. In my view, her research overlooked the importance of water. She forgot to look into the fact or did not con or consider it important how greater water loss during the night or when the animal was sleeping, because in this case, it was the animal and the sleeping condition, it, it did not matter whether it was night or day, or when it was anesthetized, that this greater water loss would create this osmotic pressure difference, that this shrinking and swelling of the cells and creating greater interstitial space could be the main factor that was responsible for the clearance of the amyloids and not what they suggested. What did they suggest? So I'm suggesting that is water driven, water driven, water is the key factor substance. And it's the less water during the sleeping state that is responsible for it. Whereas in the awake state, the animal are accessible, accessing water and eating food. Of course, in the paper, I mean, yeah, this is another sad thing. In the paper, they had no information about if the animals were drinking water or not or whether they had food or not, as if this is not important at all. I mean, I was very sad that they had no information about, you know, the water intake or the hydration status of the animals. This goes to show, and this is the point of this World Water Day presentation, to tell you that the leading scientists, people who win the Nobel Prize, unfortunately have not got the full picture of what has uh, happened, what has been happening. So, so this publication, you can read it in the literature, and I'm not going to sort of like go into the detail. It is in, published in Science, and they talked about the cerebral spinal fluid being responsible for clearance. And the important thing is, there is not a single mention about hydration status of animals. This is the paper. You can actually get it. It's published in Science in 2013. It has been cited 3,349 times. Remember the number? 3,349 times cited by other workers because they considered it to be an important paper. It went in the media, it was all over because it was a fundamental study because they showed the function of sleeping. Hitherto, people did not understand sleeping as a functional role. Now, uh, Nettergaard suggested that it is a waste disposal system of the body, that sleeping enables waste clearance. So they did not have anything about uh, you know, the hydration status of the animals. Did they have water before, sleep, uh, before sleeping or application of anesthesia? Did the awake animals had a ad libitum access to food and water? Nothing about it. The cell volume changes could be due to hydration station was not considered at all. So this is the sad thing about this particular uh, piece of research, and I hope they will consider this. So what they did was the natural sleep or anesthesia are associated with a 60% increase in the interstitial space. That's the space between the cells in the brain, okay? 60% increase. So they wanted to find out what causes this increase in interstitial space. So they went into another direction. They looked at hormonal effect, uh, neuromodulatory effect, and so on. They completely ignored the fact that the water status in the sleep and anesthetic animals will be very different from the awake state. In the awake state, it will be hydrated. The cells will be swollen. Interstitial space will be limited because all the cells are swollen and they're uh, you know, falling over one another, stuck with one another almost. But when the animals are sleeping or anesthetized, they will just breathe and they're not drinking any water and they're not drinking, eating any food. So there is no food from uh, water from food or no water coming from water, the fluid drunk. Therefore, they'll be dehydrated. The cells will be more strong, mild dehydration, because as I told you, there are hormones to maintain osmolality in the body. 
vasopressin and so on. So completely ignored. This is the fundamental paper from 2013, which is the fundamental basis for this theory that I have proposed. So they, they went into they went into talking about uh, neuromodulators and so on. Of course, I don't ignore the possibility at all that these neuromodulators are involved in. This is what they've uh, shown that these neuromodulators can actually be involved in the cell volume maintenance. I don't disagree with that. That plays a role. But at the same time, I believe the the ruling out the role of water, you know, sleeping in uh, and and so on. The mice are not drinking water and so on, and they're evaporating a lot. Uh, ev water is evaporating. Uh, therefore, the mice are going to be in a more dehydrated state. I'm writing here all of these things. Serum osmolality will be higher compared to the awake mice, which presumably had no access to food and water, had access to food and wa water. And therefore, the issue is that water could have been the main factor that has actually led to the results that they've seen. I'm convinced that water has been either the most important factor or one of the contributory factors. And the neuromodulatory actions that they suggest with respect to sort of uh, noradrogenic uh, signaling is not the only issue that is linked to cell volume changes. Water is an important factor. And they completely neglected it altogether in this uh, important landmark paper in the field of Alzheimer's research and sleeping research. So what I believe is it's not just the ad uh, adrenergic signaling that is responsible for modulating neuronal activity and volume of the interstitial uh, space, but difference in hydration status of the body linked to sleep awake status must play a pivotal role. Therefore, my suggestion to uh, Professor Nedergaard and others who are working in this field, experts who are working in this field, people with far better technology and uh, intellect than I have, my humble request to them is that to adapt your model, redo these experiments, consider the hydration status of the animal, consider water, how much water was drunk, how much water is in the body of the animals, and then see what results you get, and then we better understand what actually drives the removal of wastes from the brain. Is it just as simple uh, uh, as some uh, uh, adrenergic signaling, or is water a key driver, and what a loss during sleep is a key driver because sleep quality is important. When you sleep well and deep, then you'll probably lose a lot more water because basically it's not disruptive. You're not waking up. You're losing a lot of water through sweating, through evaporation, through the deep breathing you are doing. So you will get these uh, 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 shrunken cells in your body. And that, cons that is consistent with studies which have shown that you lose more water during sleep and you have shown that the brain volume decreases during sleep, body weight decreases during sleep. Are this going to be insignificant? And that brings back the question of me talking about the tree. The tree that loses the leaves that lose water and that brings water from under the ground to the top of the tree 100 meters high. The power of evaporation, the power of water loss. We generated electricity from water. Okay, so water is not something, electricity is a great power. Evaporation is a great power. Evaporation can help, uh, you know, sort of purify water and so on. So why shouldn't sweating and loss of water through the normal process of body or breathing and so on not play an important role in the functioning of our body? This is a great, you know, sort of uh, source of sadness for me. The great scientists have completely overlooked uh, the role of water loss and water gain in understanding uh, 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 the physiology of humans and animals and thereby understanding better uh, disease processes and finding cures for disease. And I hope this presentation will go some way in creating interest and discussion and create, maybe someone is watching there out there, maybe someone is watching there who has got the technology and the tools, they will go and do the research and publish a paper and tell the world that this is the way to do it or do a, a clinical trial uh, preventing uh, the uh, Alzheimer's disease or um, you know, sort of reversing Alzheimer's disease and dementia through water uh, um, uh, hypothesis that we have proposed here. So I don't want to go into uh, the specifics. There are lots of studies that people have done about research on the uh, role of uh, you know, uh, diet and spices and all of these things, which helps uh, the body to uh, get rid of water and therefore creates the water dynamics in the body is much more efficient. And therefore, waste removal, nutrient uh, you know, transport and everything becomes much more better. You know what? The understanding regarding the role of sweat gland and the skins have been done sometime, for some time. 
And there is someone I very much admire, and he's listening to this presentation today, is Professor Elema Savadi from the University of Nottingham. He's an emeritus professor there, but he was a highly active scientist and he continues to be very highly active. And I think he made a very important contribution back in 1983. I dug up his details. I contacted him since August 2017. So since August 2017, I have been in on and off contact with him to try and find out about his work because I felt that was important. His research showed the role of sweat glands in Alzheimer's disease. The, he suggested, I mean, this is an email communication with him recently. He says, you know, I asked him about his data. He said the data are fine, but our thinking about the possible mechanism has moved on since 1983. At that time, we assumed that there may be a deficit in peripheral cholinergic sympathetic neurons or a change in the sweat glands themselves, just located within the sweat glands and so on. So it's a local localized effect in Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease seems to people, patients seems to have them, uh, you know, sort of uh, have their uh, sweat glands affected. So, so, so what he's saying is that it is correct that the re reduced responsiveness of the sweat glands, and that is he's referring to the responsiveness of the sweat glands to uh, carbacol and choline in Alzheimer's disease patients may reflect reduced impulse flow in the peripheral sympathetic neurons. This, however, is likely to be caused by a reduction in central sympathetic outflow. So the reason for this may lie in damage to locus corylius, the main noradrogenic nucleus that shows early de degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the link between the sweat glands the skin and the brain was already demonstrated by a British scientist nearly 40 years ago. But do you know what? If you look how many times this paper was cited, look at this. This was published in 1983. Nedergaard's paper has been cited nearly 4,000 times. Professor Elami Sabadi's work, which is about a fundamental principle about sensitiveness of the skin and the damage to the sweat glands, responsiveness of the sweat glands that are altered in Alzheimer's disease patients was only cited 19 times. What a shame. Yet this was an opportunity missed. Because if you looked into the skin and thought about the tree, thought about water and the part of the water cycle in the human body. You know, we talk about the water cycle. If you search water cycle in the, uh, in the internet, it's about the water cycle that we all know about. Water going into the you know clouds and coming back and going under the ground and so on into the seas and the rivers and so on. But there is a water cycle in the human body. And this is the one of the things that I thought about, you know, so as I said, since 2013, nearly a decade ago, there is a water cycle in the human body and the water loss through the skin, through the mouth and the nose and everything drives, you know, is a dynamic process that is going on in the body every day, day and night. And this alteration of, you know, on, off, on, off, unplugging and plugging, shrinking and swelling, and this continuous rhythm that is going on is what keeps us healthy. And even the heart is something that also requires the support of this system of the water cycle movement for it to be effective so that all the work does not become a duty for itself only, you know, or the kidneys are the only things that does the water removal and so on, and the heart, the only pumping around the body. So the hypothesis that I'm proposing here is that the heart, the lungs, the kidneys and all the brain and everything work along with the skin, along with the sweat glands as a holistic system. And that I think has been ignored and that has been to our peril because that has slowed down cures and most importantly prevention. Because if you can advise the people, look, you need to be active, don't block your sweat glands, ensure that you keep yourself hydrated, no matter what, what you do, make sure you drink, make sure that you look at your urine to see if it's, you know, color is dark, that you're not getting hydrated enough, making sure you have a regular cycle of water, doing exercise, which gets water out of the body through, uh, through breathing and through sweating, and then, you know, replenish yourself with water. So you have a cycle of cleansing effect that is going on. This is, I think, people of the past, the ancient scientists and thinkers have thought about all of these things, perhaps not in scientific details, as we are doing nowadays, but they've thought of this already. And what I'm suggesting here is trying to bring back those ancient ideas in a way into modern scientific thinking. And I, what I tried to show is on how the latest scientific researchers have, you know, have completely forgotten that water is a fundamental substance. And even the latest diseases we are doing research on cancer or Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease needs 
looking at water. So this is Professor uh, Elmer Sawadi, who is actually uh, uh, listening in to this presentation today from Nottingham University. I really uh, like him for his nice work that he did and the fact that he continues to maintain contact and he contacted me and, uh, you know, I mean, but since 2017. So you're talking about five years. And another person who did some work 10 years later. So I would say one of the first person to think about the sweat glands and so on is a British scientist from the University of Nottingham, uh, Professor Elmer Savadi and colleagues. The other person who I communicated with also, you know, some time ago is a professor from uh, Saul Elmstall from Lund University, university I went to, you know, have a collaboration with in the past. He is another scientist in 1993, he's, he published a paper showing that increased sweat sodium concentration in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So there is something going on with the sweat glands of, uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. We know that sweat glands uh, performance and sweating reduces with aging. We do know this. And we know that Alzheimer's disease is a, especially late onset Alzheimer's disease is a disease that starts around 60 and so on and is linked with aging process. So what I think is happening is that as a sweat gland performance is reduced, physical activity is reduced, people are not drinking enough water, the hydration dehydration cycle is not happening in a full way, the body's water cycle is not uh, performing uh, well on a daily basis, sleeping is not happening well, therefore that dehydration and hydration cycle that needs to happen is not happening. So overall, all of these things over a time leads to build up of toxins in the brain and other parts of the body, whether it is the amyloids, even many other different uh, substances are found in high concentration in the brain. Aluminum concentration is high. Lactate concentration has been found to be high. Urea concentration has been found to be high. Even sodium concentration has been found to be high in brains of people with lactate disease. And we'll find more things that are high in abundance. Bad things, if you want to call them. Things that can be harmful in high amount in the brain because the water circulation in the brain has been damaged because of damage to the skin, damage to the water flow, the dynamics of the water uh, you know, within the body has been hampered, inhibited in many different ways because of lack of physical activity, lack of regular drinking of water, lack of eating foods that are good in terms of uh, water hydration and in terms of uh, diuretic effects and so forth. So combination of this slowly, slowly, slowly will bring a stage when it will be a position where someone will develop Alzheimer's disease. It's a progressive condition. So if you manage to prevent the people going into that stage, we can actually prevent the disease from happening. So just like with Professor Roy Taylor, what I'm suggesting here is that the NHS needs to work with the scientists to develop a strategy where people can prevent or delay, delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease through physical activity, the right diet, exercise, and so on and so forth. And this is what I want to stress. And this work of these scientists who have worked for, you know, some time ago, they're still working. Professor Elmer is still working, and so is so is uh, Professor Amstel still working? He, he says he says yes. The data is still valid about the high salt concentration. Our research group has an interest in autonomic function and blood pressure regulation, especially in relation to cerebral blood flow and cognitive function. Blood flow. It's not the job of the heart alone. I think this water loss through uh, you know when you do exercise and when you lose the water through uh, sweating and all of these things and water loss through evaporation and all of all of these things creates these uh, osmotic pressures these uh, you know hydrostatic pressures and so on and these differences in pressure just like with the tree helps the heart in ensuring that there is good uh, blood flow cerebral flow blood uh, you know uh, blood flow into the uh, into the brain and therefore the waste does not stagnate stagnation is the issue here. and stagnation is resulting from a uh, reduction in the cycle of water in our body and you know what you look at this paper this paper was published in 1993 was cited only four times and such an important paper in my view, because it shows the most important organ in our body is the skin. And the sweat glands there, and they're showing the high sodium concentration in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Why wasn't this followed up? It's often we get focused on looking at the details, the trees, and we forget to look at the forest. We forget to look at the bigger picture. We get engrossed in numbers and details of the things we do small things of details. We don't have the bigger picture. That is why such important work of Professor Elmer, Saul Elmstrom, who have in, implicated the role of the biggest organ in our body with Alzheimer's disease was ignored. There's hardly any studies almost on the skin. Very few studies on the skin. Very sad really indeed. And I, I really want to ask the people who are doing Alzheimer's disease research to look at the system in a holistic manner rather than a much more 
sort of like tunnel vision approach that some scientists unfortunately uh, have because of reasons I don't know. So, I mean, these are, uh, uh, these are, uh, this is a point that I like to make at the same time that this research that I'm doing is part of different things I do with my colleagues and collaborators and, and the team that I have at the De Montfort University, my students, uh, research uh, workers and so on. All of these people have contributed in different ways. Uh, discussions with them is always useful. I'm writing at the moment an article with Dr. Ahmad Al-Alaq, uh, Professor Hussein Abdul Qadim. Uh, and also Dr. Kara Hussein on this theory, on this hypothesis. And this presentation on the World Water Day, dedicated to all those people who died of dehydration, is to get this subject to be discussed so that we can get feedback and we can produce our article to be even better and even more sound and stronger in different ways. But there are many colleagues and friends who have been in involved in, in the work that I've been doing, and I cannot forget them. As I always say, their discussions also encouraged me. And therefore, this is an important point that especially, for example, Professor Hussein Abdul Qadim, for example, has been in from the University of Kufa. I had good discussions with him as a medical doctor and his, uh, you know, sort of enthusiasm and interest about this hypothesis. When I told him about the hypothesis, you know, speaking to him and everything, and he became really excited and this is a great theory. I agree with that and he's involved in the work and we are writing uh, the work together to, uh, you know, produce something that will benefit researchers and especially human beings who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease and so on. So, you know, we cannot forget the fact that addition kills even people in advanced countries. In the earlier slide, I showed you about people dying in, dying in, in the deserts and so forth and everything. But here in the UK, here are the reports. Remember I told you, first killed 345 non-COVID patients in hospitals and care homes. During the 345 people, non-COVID, so these are data. This data has to be looked at carefully and so on. There is always different arguments and so forth about these things. But lots of people die. And thousands of people have been dying in, in our hospitals because of dehydration. On this World Water Day, I plead to those who are in authority and those who are in power to make water the central theme in healthcare, preventing dehydration as a central theme in healthcare. People working on Alzheimer's research to make emphasis on water as something that is not the wallpaper, not something that is in the background, but to make it a central theme in their research, never to exclude water and its role in any analysis of data and so on. This is one thing that I request in this presentation. So my research on water is diverse. Jonathan Jones, he's one of my PhD students, very hardworking guy. He's right now in Swansea in Wales. I know that he's watching and his picture is here. Richard Jenkins, a very good friend of mine. He's also, I'm sure, watching as well because we went to uh, Swansea together and he's also from Wales. Uh, you can see we did water analysis uh, in, in Swansea on a river purifying the water. And we also did things far away from our homes here in the UK, in Bangladesh, where we looked at the water pollution, arsenic pollution and so on. So water research is very close to my heart. And all those friends of mine and researchers I mentioned, they have contributed in many ways. Uh, I cannot do everything myself. No one can do everything myself. No one knows everything. Uh, and therefore, we need each other. And that is good that we don't know it, uh, everything. Because if you did know everything, then you would not need anyone else. We become more arrogant than we are already. So it is good that we are ignorant to some extent. And here, you know, some of the final slide is the Lancet Commission on Dementia, which is their producer report, sort of like every three, four years. So the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care in 2020 report of the Lancet Commission, they said this, they had modifying 12 risk factors might prevent or delay up to 40% of dementia. I, I'm a strong believer in prevention is better than cure. This is, I really believe that and I think this should be taught in schools from a very young age. Prevention is better than cure should be taught at schools from a very young age so that uh, we can become our own doctors. And one of the sayings of Hippocrates, which I quite love, is that they said, whoever is not their own doctor is a fool. So it's a very nice thing so that we can train our youngsters to uh, in the ideas of prevention from a very young age so that we don't end up with Alzheimer's disease because of not drinking enough water or not doing exercise and eating wrong types of food and having sedentary lifestyles and so on. So there are 12 different factors that were found that they say are modifiable, the things that you can change to prevent uh, you know, or delay uh, you know, dementias and so on. So excessive alcohol consumption is one of them. These are the new ones they added in 2020. Excessive alcohol consumption, 
head injury. Muhammad Ali, I'm sure, must have suffered from from a lot of uh, you know head injuries because of his boxing, and he developed Parkinson's disease, hypertension. Uh, sort of air pollution is another one they added. Less education. It seems like the people who are less educated probably maybe drink less water. This has been shown as well from a study in, uh, from the USA. So less education, maybe people are less aware about the drinking of uh, uh, water and therefore they drink, don't drink enough water as often or maybe they don't do those health, uh, uh, better, uh, you know, health improvement activities, good diet. Uh, maybe they don't have the money to buy the good diet. So there is inequality issue as well. It's not just about knowledge and information. It's about inequalities as well. Less education, hypertension, hearing impairment, smoking, obesity, depression, physical inactivity, big thing in my view. Uh, you know, I should do more physical activity. Sometimes life is not easy to do these things because circumstances sometimes prevent people from being able to do the things they want to do. Uh, diabetes, infre infrequent social contact. And COVID-19 has made us more antisocial in a way because we just become separate from one another much more than ever before. And I think there is going to be a greater increase in dementia as a consequence of many things, including the fact that people have found that those people who are affected by COVID-19 may develop uh, you know, cognitive decline, and that may lead to dementia in the future. So there is a prevention uh, strategy that we need to be in place very quickly. But before I sort of like end this presentation, what is missing in this Lancet Commission about dementia prevention and intervention? This is the key point. And I want, if there is anybody from the Lancet Commission listening to this presentation, anyone from the public health that is listening to this presentation, what I want to say is that these modifiable risk factors should include water and diet because water and diet are modifiable. These are things we can modify easily. We can, if you are given the choice, you know, drinking more water is something we can. We can modify that. We can drink more tea, coffee, beverages that are beneficial for us and so on and so forth. This is modifiable. So water and diet should be included in the next Lancet Commission as another, maybe water is uh, maybe 13th and diet maybe the 14th. So they can be added as additional modifiable risk factors because there is enough data showing that vegetarian diet is preventive against Alzheimer's disease. There is enough data available as a matter of fact that dehydration is one of the things that they will ask before people get Alzheimer's disease. So dehydration and constipation, constipation is one of the things that happens before people develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. So constipation could be for different reasons, but one of the reasons is infrequent drinking of water, not enough water, not enough fiber. So essentially, essentially we can do things to prevent the disease, uh, you know, and uh, uh, or delay the disease and maybe even reverse it. So with this, I, I really like to end my presentation and I'd like to thank you all for listening to me. And once again, you know, I'm dehydrated now because I've been speaking and breathing and therefore I have to drink a glass of water. really i feel much better now so thanks very much indeed for listening to me i'm ready to take questions and comments uh, whoever is there so we have some time for that so please uh, let's uh, move on okay brian austin he's got a question here uh, Brian, my good friend, Professor Brian Austin from uh, St. George's Medical School in London. I know him for uh, several decades when I was working with Professor Danny Chapman. Uh, in the US, the average person drinks only 1.8 cups of water per day, far less than the age required for good health. Uh, the important point here, uh, Brian, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I mean, everyone is different. One size does not fit all. For some, eight might be too much, and another person, uh, eight might be too little. So it depends on their occupation. It depends on their, you know, sort of like body size and, and so on. You know, women are different from men. You know, women, for example, lose more water in some respects. Women's incidence of Alzheimer's disease is higher than men. Now, women lose more water from their body because they lose what men lose, but they also lose water to uh, the vaginal fluids, for example. So their loss of water is greater. And, and, and they give birth to babies and they have the menstrual cycle and so on. So therefore, you know, it's not one size fits all. I think it's uh, something that we need to personalize so that each individual have a uh, water intake that is the most appropriate for their needs. The important thing is that there is a good dynamic process going on in the body of flushing out the toxins, shrinking and swelling going on so that we do not have the chance of things accumulating. When things start accumulating, 
we reach a point of no return and then disease impacts. So yes, uh, I agree with you, Brian. I mean, this is an important, uh, important point. I know you came and gave a lecture at DMU many years ago. So yes, I agree. I agree with what you were saying. So there are, there are some more questions coming through. I think there is a question here from Kashama. Uh, what I'm understanding is even maintaining right balance of water in your body is equally important to manage the optimal health. You are right, absolutely, Kashama. This is absolutely right. And optimal water It's not overhydration and it's not dehydration. It's a, it's a cycle. You know, the body that we, are, uh, that we have is goes through a cycle. Uh, when we are sleeping, naturally, we don't drink water. We don't eat food. Our body is going to have less water in it but our hormones will ensure that we don't completely become dehydrated. There is enough tissue stored in our uh, organs. When you are fasting, let's say for example, Ramadan fasting, people fast for 12 to 18 hours and they drink water before they start the fast and they drink, the first thing they do after breaking, uh, to break the fast is drink water. So uh, water is never uh, absent from the scene, even in these traditional fasting that people do in different culture. Yes, there has to be a, a cycle of uh, the process of hydration, dehydration plugging and plugging, the movement going on, just a constant cycle. As long as they're moving, just like the heart is beating daily, uh, the water cycle in the body has to beat daily, if you want to use that word. So these two things, uh, you know, this maintenance of the balance is absolutely important. So there are more comments, I think. Yes, uh, I mean, as a, as a, there's a question here, is there any active research plant in UMU on this topic? Yes, and this presentation, I've asked all my colleagues to take part and uh, listen to this presentation and try to remind them and send messages and things like this. So I hope there will be greater collaboration. I know one of my colleagues, uh, Louis Dunford, for example, is working on hyperhidrosis, in which case it is a problem. Over ex excessive water loss is the issue there. And therefore, these people need to you know, hydrate themselves more. But a healthy balance of water loss and water gain is important. And if we can do some research on this area, uh, whether with animals or a clinical trial with humans, uh, to see if you can reverse the uh, Alzheimer's disease or prevent or delay, I think would be absolutely brilliant and we need to work with the NHS. So the issue here that I've tried to emphasize is that, uh, you know, we need to consider water in research because this is being missing. And on this World Water Day, my message goes to scientific researchers I mentioned about the work of uh, Dr. Uh, Nedergaard because she inspired my research. But at the same time, I have to be honest. And I have, at the same time, I have to be frank and produce constructive criticisms. She may win a Nobel Prize, and I hope she does. But she has forgotten the role of water in the clearance of wastes from the brain. Water is, I think, a fundamental player in that, and that should not have been ignored. And I hope future researchers won't ignore it and people will redo the work by fully uh, taking into consideration uh, the water intake. So this is one message. The second message is from my own personal experience of what happened with my mother and the suffering that she went through. There are people who can be surrounded by water, but they cannot drink it. And the reason for that is because they're disabled, they cannot speak out, they have problems, we need to help them. So we need to find ways whereby hospitals, care homes, and others can deliver water to the needy whenever they need it, uh, whether through new technologies or whether through human beings being there. In our case, in my case, myself, my brothers were there to help my mother, and thankfully she became hydrated and she returned home. Um, that was a, uh, that was we are very lucky with that. But not everyone can, uh, not everyone has been lucky. And therefore, we, uh, we, we need to ask the authorities and those responsible to ensure that hydration and water intake is a central pillar in public health policies. And also, like Brian, my good friend Brian was mentioning about water intake and the need for it. And some people in some countries are not taking enough water. We need to ask why. Why aren't we taking enough water? I think the main reason is that our life is too busy. We are too busy with the computers. We are too busy with our work, uh, we, we, the type of work we do. And all of these things means we forget the fundamental role of water um, in our lives. And it becomes absent from us and we forget. Some people who are more educated, let's say, about the need for hydration, they may always carry a bottle of water with them, but not everyone does. 
So the fact that people from certain ethnic minorities, for example, amongst African communities in America, two to three times higher rate of Alzheimer's disease compared to the white Caucasians. This is very sad. Why? This lots of factors. It's multifactorial. It's very complex. But I wouldn't be surprised if they had no water intake. There are studies which indicate, for example, children from uh, African and Hispanic, uh, non-white Hispanic background, these children drink less water compared to white children, white Caucasian children. So the water consumption, uh, plain water consumption, for example, is low among some groups. And this could be the factor that could be contributing to their buildup of toxins in the body because it cannot be uh, removed. So there is a lot of different things we can do. And one of those things that I'm stressed in this presentation is that this theory that I suggested here needs to be proven. And it can be proven to scientific research in the lab. And someone raised a point, what work is going to be done at DME? Uh, I hope, along with my colleagues nationally here and internationally, we engage in research to prove this hypothesis in terms of this uh, water uh, you know, uh, driven clearance of wastes from the brain, the role of sweating, the role of insensible water loss in creating the environment for swelling and shrinking of cells that provides the force for movement of nutrients and clearance of wastes. These are things I think we need to discuss and on this World, 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 uh, World Water Day, I hope that all of you will do your best to support those nearby you, your friends, your colleagues who are living around you, who are in need of water, wherever they may be, the elderly or uh, you know young who are in desperate need of water. Please help people to have access to water in whichever way you can. And one of the ways to do is through research. And this is what we are trying to do. And here I have a comment from my head of uh, school and a good friend, uh, Paul Ellingworth. How can we get Lancet to listen? What are we cheaper to drink, at least in the West, than what it costs to treat people once conditions apply? Once again, prevention better than cure, cure not a good catcher. Yes, yes, uh, yes, Paul, I agree with you. I agree with you completely, yeah? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the thing, you know, that we often uh, want to make things complicated. There are simple solutions out there, but you don't want to go. You want to go after the details or looking for complex things when the obvious answer is there. And I think this presentation is highlighting the obvious answer is water in Alzheimer's disease and most neurogenerative, neurogenerative diseases and indeed good health as a whole. Exercise linked with water. Diuretics, which are one of the medicines that are prescribed for uh, you know, uh, hypertension, are now being considered, water pill are being considered for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Why? Because it removes water from the body and therefore it unplugs the body so that this healthy dynamics is it's like getting rid of a dam that is blocking the, blocking the river. Let the rivers flow. Let the river be a river. Let the delta be a delta. Let the human being be a human being. And let's not block things using uh, you know, uh, various chemicals and other things so that the water can't get out of us or we stop get, uh, putting water into our bodies because we forget about it and so on. So, so you are right, uh, Lancet, I hope they will are listening and I hope they will listen and we all have friends and, and contacts and I'm sure someone will pass on this information to them because what I'm suggesting here is not rocket science. It's not, a, not rocket science, it's obvious. It's just that I made a point about it and I thought about it for a long time. And at a day when my mother is in this other room, ill, sitting on a, uh, in a, on a chair and she doesn't, uh, cannot manage to get water for herself. This is a tribute to my mother and tribute to all those people who have passed away because of thirst and dehydration. So this is what motivated me to share this knowledge and information to everyone. And I hope something good will come out of it. And if that happens, then I'm satisfied. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for listening to this presentation. You have my email address, you have my details. Please keep in touch. If you want to collaborate, you can collaborate. But I hope that you do something to make a difference. Thank you very much indeed, and goodbye.